teach for about five, ten minutes. Um, I definitely don't claim to be a teacher at all necessarily. But, uh, you know, for, for probably about the past, um, coming on two years now, the Lord's been stirring uh, just a foundational message in our ministry that I would really like to share with you. And after I share, we're just going to ask God to send fire on us, you know. We're just going to ask God that he would just come and he would just release his Holy Ghost and just just come be the fire in us, you know. And, uh, we, man, we want to so thank CI for having us and everything. We feel like we're home, man. Awesome, awesome. So uh, I'm just, I'm going to speak on the Nazarite. Um, we're going to go to Numbers chapter 6. And I promise I, I, I don't think I'll keep you too long speaking at you. But I just, I feel like, I feel like, Eddie and I were talking before the meeting uh, on the phone. I mean, it's so rare. He said, this guy's been on the road forever. He said, man, I don't think I've ever had this happen to where, you know, I, I've been at the same exact place with the same minister un, unscheduled ever. And uh, we were at the same place this, just this past uh, few days ago, too. Uh, uh, neither of us knew about it. So the Lord's shaking something up here in Florida. Let's go before him right now. Would you lift your hands to him? Father, we ask you tonight that you would just come with the fire, Lord. Lord, we say that our heart is your altar. Would you come and be the fire upon the altars of our hearts? Lord, I pray right now that you would just begin to send forth a sound. Lord, the sound of a Nazarite generation. Lord, would you just begin to release Release a sound, Lord, in the earth, Lord. Everybody here tonight, Lord, would you just begin to release fire in the bellies of the men and women here tonight, Lord. Lord, the old and the young together, Lord, would you just begin to release a new passion, a new zeal. Father, would you give us a single gaze for you, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would bring us back to the place of first love. Lord, all over this room, Lord, would you just begin to release a baptism of first love over every single one of us, Lord, to where we return to the place of, of just hearing the name of Jesus and weeping, Lord, because your presence was enough, and you and you alone were enough, Lord. I pray that you bring us back to that place. I pray, Lord, that we would see the height from which we have fallen. Lord, we come before you. We say that we are poor, blind, and naked without you, Lord. Father, we declare that there is a, that tonight starts a new shift in our hearts, Lord. I thank you that every single person here tonight was drawn by the Holy Ghost for such a time as this. Father, would you just bring us together as an offensive army, Lord, as we listen to the things that you have to say as we go before you, Lord. Lord, and I pray that tonight would be a night that you extend the scepter over us, Lord. Father, I declare right now that there's a new breed of Esther's rising over this area right now, over all of Florida. Lord, from the northern tip to the southern tip, would you just begin to release a scepter over this state, Lord? We declare Florida is a revival state, and the Holy Ghost is hovering over this state like never before. Lord, you've been breathing over this state. You've been breathing over this region, Lord. We declare right now that the time is now. We declare that Esther's time has come to go before the king. So Lord, begin to raise up young prophets, young apostles, Lord, old prophets, old apostles, those that you have had hidden, Lord, for such a time as this, Lord. Pull the curtain back on them, Lord. I pray that they begin to go before you, Lord, Lord, for, for the whole entire nation, Lord, that you would raise up mighty voices of fire in this region, Lord, mighty voices of fire in this state, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that out of Florida, Lord, that you would pull the trigger on the rest of the nation, Lord, that, that the bones would begin to rattle, that a sound would go forth from this state, Lord, that would shake a whole nation, Lord. Send your fire, Lord. Come on, just ask him that. Send your fire, Lord. Send your fire, Lord. Send your fire, Lord. We ask you for a baptism of fire. Lord, let tonight be a night, a Lord, of, of, a, of a nationwide shift, Lord. Send your fire, Lord. Oh, God, we stand before you, Lord. 
We stand before you, Lord. We say, Lord, that, that we do have faith to believe that something nationally even could shift, Lord, from a gathering of remnant believers, Lord, who are dead already, Lord, who have nothing else to lose because we've already lost our lives. But, Lord, we step up, Lord, and we just we begin to sit with you on your throne, Lord. Begin to, begin to release secrets to us, Lord. Just lift your hands. Father, release secrets to us, Lord. Begin to release revelation like never before. Lord, begin to release uh, sounds, Lord. Begin to release messages, Lord. Begin to release apostolic messages that carry a weighty authority for the nation, for the world. Begin to release a prophetic arrow. Lord, release an arrow. Release an arrow, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would release a prophetic accuracy. Lord, that these, these young prophets, these old prophets would be shot forth as arrows of deliverance. And I declare over them that they will hit their target. In Jesus' name, give them a shout. Come on. I'm pretty gripped tonight uh, with, with this Nazarite thing. And we're just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go for it. Go to number six. And if you've heard it before, sweet, because we're all going to get rebaptized with it tonight. Number six, one. Before we start reading, it's been on my heart recently. I recently heard a message, uh, Jesse Engel, Lou Engel's son, spoke a message on love. I just heard it through an MP3 or something like that, and he spoke on the love of God. And the Lord gave me revelation from that message. Think about this thought, okay? Before anything else, before we talk about this, before we, I don't know how this is going to end, but I know it's just going to be a Holy Ghost explosion, and we're all just going to be so gripped with a fresh love for God. So before we go into anything like that, think about this. When, when they come to Jesus and they ask him, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus, being fully God and fully man at the same time, begins to, to show the vulnerability of his heart. And he opens up and, and he just, I could just see him, you know, he just looks at him and he just says, with a piercing truth, and he just says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I, to me, that's so tender of Jesus to, to, to speak to us, to, to show us those things, because here you have the, the God of the universe in, in flesh, and they go, hey, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus doesn't say, go shake the world for my name. He didn't say, Save a million people before you die and take a million souls to heaven with you. You know, when they say, Jesus, what's the most important thing to you and your father, because you two are one, what's the most important thing to you that we need to do? What's the greatest commandment? Jesus shows his vulnerability. He opens his heart and he says, really, I just want voluntary love back. That's all I want. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And from that place, it overflows into love your neighbor as yourself. How tender of him. Can you see Jesus? He's, he just gets so vulnerable and so tender with us. He says, really, the only thing I want, the main thing I want from everybody is just, just to be loved back. <laughs> is that too much to ask? And Jesus was just, he was revoicing and he was re-trumpeting the message, I believe, that, that was released even in the beginnings in Genesis. And we're going to re-look at it here in Numbers chapter 6. Jesus was just revoicing this, this message here, and it's Numbers chapter 6, 1. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman desires to consecrate an offering and take a vow of the Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord. Stop right there. He says, if either a man or a woman, I grew up uh, hearing, hearing a Nazarite message probably starting about 10 years ago. I, I, was, I was 15 years old. I didn't know anything about God. I was raised in church, and we're going to talk about this in a second. I was raised in church. I was raised. I knew the lingo. I was even leading worship for my youth group. 
I, I, I thought I knew it, and then actually it was Lou. Lou comes in and blazes this Nazarite message, and something in me got so gripped. They, they had to peel me off the floor that night because I, I just didn't want to leave. Something in me happened that night, and something in me, it even, it's, it's even tender for me to talk about it right now because it was so profound. The Lord just put this thing in me, and, and rather it was me more just realizing, wow, this is why I was born. It's a man or a woman. It, anybody can do it. I was 15 years old. You may be 95 years old here tonight, but I believe the Lord is releasing an invitation over us tonight. And it's to vow a vow of a Nazarite. Let's keep going. Verse 3, he shall separate himself. Stop right there. Listen, just, I'm just going to say that again. He shall separate himself. He shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. Verse 4, all the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the great vine. Verse 5, all the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall come upon his head. No razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he has separated himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. Listen to that. For the days that he has separated himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. So here the Lord says, Every single day that you live as a vowed, consecrated one, I'll just see you as holy. Pretty interesting. Then he shall let the locks of his hair, of his head grow. Verse 6. All the days of his vow that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean even for his father or his mother or his brother or his sister. Even when they die, because his separation to the Lord is on his head. Verse 8, the Lord re-says it. All the days of his separation, he shall be holy unto the Lord. So the Lord offers this invitation to the people of Israel. And th- this, is, this is where it's at, okay? Jesus has just established everybody, uh, uh, you know, coming through as his people, coming through Exodus and everything. It's all good. Everybody has the understanding that we are the people of the Lord. Everybody sees Moses going up, you know, and the cloud coming down. Everybody knows what's up with the Lord. And everybody's like, yeah, we're the Lord's people. But then the Lord, out of the same vulnerability in his heart, out of the same uh, desire in his heart, he, I, I could just see him getting close to Moses one day. And he goes, hey, Moses, hey, <laughs> tell the people if they want to separate a special a special consecration to me. Give them this supplement. Give them the law of the Nazarite. And I, it, it's the Lord once more just showing us the tenderness and the vulnerability of his heart that he wants voluntary love back. In these days, it was the law, but in, t- in today's day, it's, it's out, of, out, out of the Holy Spirit's desire in your heart. It's out of the longings and the yearnings. It's out of the hunger and the thirst in your heart for God. And, and, and it's not a legalistic thing anymore. It, it, it's, we see now through the eyes of the cross, we see now that, that this is actually an invitation for us to, to show Him our, our, our abandoned love. I mean, I know in worship there's been so many times, or even in prayer, or any time walking with the Lord, I've prayed prayers like, Lord, I want you to have it all. Lord, I just, I want to give you everything. Lord, I want it to just be you and you alone in my life. And then the Lord just knocks on my door with the Nazarite thing. He's like, okay, then do it. (laughs) So there's the three things, okay? No wine, no cutting of the hair, no dead bodies. And this is, you know, for, for most of you here, I'm assuming most of you here have heard the Nazarite teaching. But the no wine thing, okay, in, in the days that, that, that this book was written, wine was a legitimate pleasure of the day that the people lived in. It was just a, a common place of, of society. It's like coffee, you know. It's just like it's everywhere. It's part of the meal. It's, it's, it's not a big deal. And the, so the Lord says, hey, I don't want you to have anything to do with that. Not because it was like a legalistic thing, but because it was a legitimate pleasure of the day. So Nazarites are these people, young and old, old and young, men and women, whoever they are, they, they have this, 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 this longing in them, this, this burning thing in them that says, you know what? 
I want to just have nothing to do with the vine. I don't even want to touch the seeds or the grapes. And to me, what that means is that, like, there's a generation coming that, that, does, that doesn't care what, what people think about them. It, they just, all they want to do is just say, how far can I throw myself into God? How holy can I be? Not out of legalism, but out of desire. How, how, how far can my hunger drive me into his heart? I've already given all this other stuff up. What, can I, what else can I do, Lord, to show you that I love you? People will call you crazy. People will call you, I've been called religious. I've been called super spiritual. I've been called, you know, just, just a fanatic or whatever. But there's certain things, there's certain things in the Nazarite's life that he cannot do. Not because it's sin necessarily, but because he is vow to vow unto the Lord. And I, I heard a... Uh, F.B. Meyer say it like this in his book on John the Baptist. He said, what is permissible for others is impossible for the Nazarite. I'll say it again. He said, what is permissible for others is impossible for the Nazarite. So these Nazarite burning men and women are these, they're this crazy, wild, just, just wholehearted generation that just, that give everything to God and they just go after him, not necessarily doing, doing the things that their generation does. I tell you what, there's many of you here tonight that are, that have looked at Facebook more than you've looked at the face of God. There's many people here tonight that you have been so infatuated with your iPhones that you have not seen the blazing eyes of Jesus in a while. Is it a sin to do the Facebook thing or the iPhone thing or whatever? Not necessarily. But I'm telling you, there's a generation coming who, who, who will just separate and just cut off certain things. And I'm not trying to put this on you as, as, as a guilt thing. I'm just using those as an example. There's a generation coming who just, who don't want to do certain things that everybody else is doing just because they, in the quietness of their heart where nobody else is looking but the eyes of God, they want to just be like, Lord, I'm fully yours. That thing has no part about me. It's not that it's sin. It's just I'm just yours and yours alone. It's, you know what it is? It's the Lord raising up a voice like John the Baptist. And the way that you get a voice is that you turn every other voice in your life down so his voice can be turned up. And really, honestly, these three things, they, they kind of line themselves up with each other. The second thing was, was the, the grow the hair long. And especially today in, in the new covenant, looking through the eyes of the cross... Honestly, long hair has nothing to do with your separation. It has everything to do. It was the long hair of the Nazarites in the, la, in the early days was a testimony to everybody around them that they had vowed a vow to the Lord. They had these amazing testimonies. And it's like the longer the hair, that the, more, the, the longer that that person had vowed a special vow to give their hearts fully to the Lord. And it was this outward testimony. I'm telling you what, man. I, I have seen some believers. Uh, they do not have a good testimony. And I'm not pointing the finger, but like, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll tell about Jesus and everything. And you get around them, and they'll be angry. <laughs> you know, and, and it's cool. I get angry sometimes. I get angry a lot, actually. And, uh, you know, they'll, they'll just they'll do things that just kind of ruin their testimony. And you look at them, and you're going, you know, I love them. And they love the Lord, but... You know, just, that's kind of weird, you know, and, and their testimony gets messed up because they, you know, they're, yes, you live before God in, in, in private, but you also live before man. And in, in my opinion, it, not in a man-pleasing way, but the way that you treat others, the testimony that your life, you, you know, the, that your life oozes a testimony constantly, you know. And the way that you live before God should be spilling over. Just the testimony of your love and your abandonment for the Lord should be spilling over to where people get around you. And they just, they feel the love of Christ in your heart. To where they just, they absolutely, they, they get around you and they see the fire that's in your eyes is the same fire that they saw in Jesus' eyes that morning. You know what I'm saying? It's this, it's this, this testimony that they carry. 
So it has nothing to do with, with an outward appearance, but it has everything to do with keeping this, this quiet, this, this secret thing that you have with the Lord, that it spills over in, in, into, in, into culture around you. You know, I, I see the, the things up on the walls with the seven mountains. It, your, your devotion and your abandonment to God spills over into culture around you. And that's what this long hair thing is. And the dead bodies, to me, that, that's, that, to me that what it means is a very simple thing is that... Uh, you know, we're, we're running a race, right? And we're on this path. And it seems like every now and then someone gets taken out here. Or someone, you know, I'm praying for a, a dear brother of mine right now who, you know, he, he's going through some stuff. And if, if he doesn't open himself up, he may be one who dies suddenly. You know, and, and, and I love him. But there, there's a point that comes so I'm just... I'm just going to have to go after him and have to just raise that man from the dead. You know what I'm saying? Because people, what, what the culture, I'm telling you, that what you let into yourself from the culture that's around you, what seems like normal to everybody else, it, 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 it does something in your heart that just deadens your heart to the Lord. And it, it dulls your spirit. It dulls your discernment. It just makes you so numb and so dull. Even coming to meetings like this, most of us here have maybe grown up into them. And we just come like, oh, man, that was awesome. Man, Eddie and his team, they did so amazing. That was great. I really got a touch. That was awesome. When for me, I'm going, man, we have an opportunity to, to pierce the heart of God and to grip his heart. Who is man that you are mindful of that, that we could even have the opportunity for us as mere men and women to grab and pierce his heart back? And people all around us are dying because of the cultural things, the, 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 the sexual perversions and the addictions and everything that's flooding our culture right now. It's like, it seems like people are getting taken out all the time. But the Nazarite, here's the difference. In the Old Testament, when you touched a dead body, you were, you were made unclean. But in the New Testament, you touch a dead body and they get raised from the dead. The Nazarite separates themselves from these dead things. But we go after the people. Like my friend who, who, you know, who, I, who I'm warring with and I'm, I'm struggling right now just praying for him. I'm, I'm doing everything I can to go after him because I'm telling you, there, there's coming a point where I just may have to just raise a guy from the dead in the spirit. And these people, these Nazarites, they separate themselves from the dead things in the culture and the dead things in their lives. So they would be used as vessels of life and they'd be used as vessels of power and authority. And they'd be able to raise a whole generation from the dead. I just, I'm just trying to figure out here what, what the Lord wants me to do next. If I should go deeper into this if, or if, what we should do. I'm going to go a little bit deeper because I, I want to share something here. Here's what Nazarites do, okay? Samuel was a Nazarite. John the Baptist was a Nazarite, okay? Have you ever seen that, that, that these men who, who, and, and women who are just so consecrated and so, so thrown into God that nothing else matters? This past week I was studying on the life of Samuel and the Lord started, started rebuking my heart a little bit. And he goes, Rick, don't you, ever, don't you dare to ever become like a son of Eli. Born into the priesthood. How many of you were born into the priesthood? I was. Born into the priesthood, born into, under anointings like this man and this ministry here. And, you know, born under it, just get used to it. And so these, these sons of Eli would just be half-hearted and just all of a sudden, before you know it, they're, they're offering strange fire to the Lord. And in these, days, in, the, in these days, the only way that you could become a priest was to be born into it, right? Except for the Nazarites. This Nazarite lifestyle was, a, was like a supplement that the Lord gave these people. And it was like an invitation to go, if you, if you do this supplement, you too can have special access to the Lord. Samuel was not born into the priesthood. But let me tell you something. When he supplemented his life as a Nazarite, he became a priest, he became a judge, and he became a prophet. He wasn't born into it. He just, he had this, this thing that was on his life. He was dedicated by his mother. He was consecrated unto the Lord. And before you know it, he's, he's there ministering before the Lord, before Eli, you know. And it was just on him. And then here you see Samuel, this Nazarite guy, this Nazarite prophet, judge, and priest, 
the Lord begins to speak to him. And this is how powerful the Nazarite's life can be. He took the oil that he had, and Samuel was one who brought in, he, he, his life, in a sense, was the anointing that, that brought in the king and, and his kingdom. Before Samuel, there was, no, there was no king. It was just the Lord and a judge and his people. But Samuel was one who the Lord used his life to, to anoint the king and bring in the kingdom. And then as I was reading through this, I was going, Lord, this is John the Baptist all the way. This guy, he's like this Nazarite burning dude, and his life was a life that ushered in the king and the kingdom. So Nazarites are people, woo, <laughs> woo. Nazarites are people who their lives have this special oil from the Lord to, to anoint, to, 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 it's like we're pouring out our lives on Jesus and releasing him and his kingdom into the earth. Just like Samuel, and just like John the Baptist. And so I, I, feel like, I feel like the Lord just wants to charge us all tonight just with, a, just with a fresh invitation going, you know, I don't know who you are. I don't care who you are. If you really just want to just tonight, if you want tonight to be just an altar in your life to where you just go, Lord, I don't even necessarily have to fill anything, but Lord, I want to be a Nazarite. I feel like the Lord's just going to give us this opportunity. I've been so geeked out on Nazarite stuff for two years now that I, I've, I've, I've studied everything I know to study about it. And it, it's so amazing because it said that, that John the Baptist's life ushered in. It, it, Noah, it doesn't talk about it in the Bible, but like uh, scholars and historians say that his life so riveted culture that he started this whole entire movement of Nazarite people all over the place. And there was no special thing that they had to do to become a Nazarite. It's just what, what, what history says is that to become a Nazarite, all you had to do was just go, may I become a Nazarite? And bam, this thing just came on you, and you were instantly a Nazarite. Or some people were, were not able to, to do, you know, the, the fullness of it, so they would, they would consecrate certain parts of their body. Like they would say, may my eyes become Nazir. You know, Nazir means separated, consecrated, set apart. It's, it's very similar to, to the word Kadesh, is holy, you know. They would say, may my ears become Nazir. May my tongue become Nazir. May my life become Nazir. You know, and all that had to do to become this, this, this Nazarite, to step into this invitation of love from the Lord, they would just say, may I be a Nazarite. And bam, it, it was said that this grace would come on them. And they would just begin to walk out this life. And I'm telling you, man, these Nazarites would just be... Amos uh, chapter 3, I believe it is, it says that Nazarites were, were just the, the elect of the elect of the culture because they, the, they had a special place with the Lord. It's like the Lord's eye was just on them and he was just hungry for them it, the same way that they were hungry for him. It's, it, it, I, I've heard Lou say it like this. It's like the burning man drawing the burning man. It's like the burning Jesus drawing his burning lovers, you know, and they're just hungry for each other. And so I just I feel like uh, I feel like the Lord just wants to release this 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 grace over anybody who would like to step in to an invitation with the Lord. You know I just I just hear the Lord just saying it again. He's like he's like saying like Hey, if tell the people who are here at CI tonight if they would like to vow a special vow unto the Lord, let them take the vow of the Nazarite. Just stand to your feet right now. We're just gonna we're just gonna start doing business with the Lord. Father, I thank you that, that you're releasing your voice over us tonight, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you're releasing your sound over us tonight. You're releasing this invitation over our hearts tonight. Now, it's as simple as this. It's as simple as history tells us. If you would choose to answer this invitation from the Lord, it's as simple as this. May I be a Nazarite. And bam, I believe that the same grace that came on the early church will come on us tonight. And the Lord will give us a special anointing to walk out a consecrated life to the Lord. But here's the thing, before you say something like that, I, I, I charge you that you would count the cost of what you're, what you're saying to the Lord. I'm telling you, man, when, when you begin to walk this type of consecrated life to the Lord, 
There are going to be so many times that you feel alone on this lonely road, but you will never be alone. There are going to be so many times that it costs you everything, and you are getting by by the skin of your teeth. But I'm telling you what, when you get to the final destination of this narrow road, you will see that it was worth it all because you get the king, his kingdom, his blazing eyes, his beating heart. You get it all. And his, the light of his face is the thing that's drawing us on this road. So just lift your hands tonight, and I guess if you want to come to the front here, we're just, we're just going to go after it. And Father, we just declare right now that we choose to be burning ones, Lord, burning men and women like John the Baptist. Lord, as we kill every other fire in our lives, that the fire of God begins to blaze that much hotter in our life. Lord, as we begin to turn down the voice of everything else in our life, that your voice in our life gets louder and louder. Lord, I pray that you would just release a grace over every person here, Lord. That you would release the same type of grace that came on the early church, Lord. That when they say, may I be a Nazarite, Lord, that they would come under that anointing, Lord. That they, would, that they would become the elect of the elect of the kingdom. Lord, and that you would use these Nazarites' life, Lord, to shake culture all around them. Lord, that you would raise them up like a voice, like John the Baptist. You would raise up voices in the wilderness, Lord, like John the Baptist. You know, it's so profound about John's life. You have archangels announcing the guy's birth. I mean, come on. Gabriel himself announces the guy's birth. And he says he'll have the spirit of Elijah on him. You have Jesus the Messiah saying that he was the greatest prophet born of women. But when they came to when the Pharisees and Sadducees came to him, they say, what are you? Are you Elijah? Gabriel said that it was on him. He could have said yes. They said, are you the prophet? Jesus said that he was the greatest prophet, born of women. But he was not concerned with his talents or his charisma or, or, or the thing that was on his life, not even the calling on his life. You know what he was more concerned about when they asked him, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? He said, no, I'm a voice. I'm a voice. The Lord raises up Nazarites that have voices that shake whole nations. The Lord raises up Nazarites that have burning voices that can shift kings and judges. The Lord raises up Nazarites that have voices that, 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 that would just, their, their lives would be like this oil that, that just anoints Jesus and ushers in Jesus and his kingdom. So just lift your hands and say, Lord, we say, may I be a Nazarite. If that's you tonight, if that's you, just speak that out. May I be a Nazarite. Just begin to do business with the Lord in your heart right now. I just, I ask, Lord, that you would just begin to speak to our hearts about things that we need to just take out of our lives that aren't necessarily sin, but, Lord, they're voices that are getting in the way of your voice. Lord, I pray that you would put a fire in our bellies, Lord, a Nazarite consecrated fire in our bellies, Lord, that we would begin to burn for you, Lord, like we have never burned for you before, Lord, especially those that have walked with you, Lord, for their whole lives, Lord. I pray that you would just release an anointing like Caleb right now, Lord, that they would have as much passion and fire in their older age, Lord, as they did in their younger years. Lord, I pray that you would just release it over all of us tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, go ahead, just, just begin to do business with the Lord.